Hello, my name is Ronald Day, and I'm Associate Vice President of the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy, and welcome to Both Sides of the Bars, a discussion-driven show that examines the criminal justice system from various perspectives, including from those most impacted by the criminal justice system. We discuss critical questions about how the current system works, its intersections with social justice, and highlight the efforts that are being made to improve the lives of everyone that is affected by it. We ask you, the viewer, to spread the word about both sides of the bars and share your comments with us on Twitter at The Fortune Society. And so today, we are honored to have some amazing guests with us, uh, Paulette and Andrew, and I'm gonna do some introductions here. To, this issue is gonna be about three-quarter housing, and so we're very excited to have you. So Andrew, is a member and leader of the Three Quarter House Tenant Organizing Project. He has firsthand experience dealing with the criminal justice system after having been incarcerated for 18 and a half years. Andrew has been active in TOPS in illegal evictions campaign and has personally ex experienced being unlawfully evicted from a three quarter house. He is also has a great deal of experience working with organizations that help youth struggling with substance abuse, family conflict, and youth involved in gang activity. And so thank you, Andrew, uh, for being with thank us. You. And we also have Paulette uh, Soltani, is that correct? That's right, thank you. All right, uh, who works for MFY Legal Services. And Paulette uh, is a community organizer for the Three Quarter House uh, Tenant Organizing Project. Uh, recently, her work has focused on informing Three Quarter House tenants about their rights working to get the NYPD to uphold the unlawful eviction law and helping to grow TOPS membership. She is committed to advocating for marginalized voices and those uh, impacted and affected by the criminal justice system. So since we're talking about three-quarter housing today, I just want to you know, start by saying housing is a critical issue in, around the country, particularly in New York City, right, mm -hmm. where uh, housing stock is more often than not going to folks who can afford to, to pay some of these really high prices, really, really high rent prices. And, and in many communities, gentrification is happening and people are being you know, moved out of neighborhoods that they've lived in for a decade, sometimes two or three decades. So you know, people understand a lot about what permanent housing is, but people have fewer and much less information about uh, transitional housing and about three-quarter housing, about emergency shelter systems and so forth. But we definitely would like for you to frame the issue for us around three-quarter housing so that people, you know, our audience get a much broader understanding about what three-quarter housing is and then we can, you can share some of your experiences working with the three-quarter housing coalitions that you work with and so forth. Mm -hmm. So Paulette, why don't we start with you? Why don't you, you know, tell us about what is a three-quarter house? And, you know, what are some of the characteristics of three-quarter house, housing? And sure. So the first thing to know about a three-quarter house is that it's basically a building in New York City that's renting out beds to single adults, both okay. men and women. Most of the time, um, it's either one gender or the other. OK. Um, inside of the houses, people are living maybe four or five, six people in a room. Oftentimes, okay. they don't have kitchen facilities to use. Sometimes they do. Um, sometimes the kitchens are converted into rooms where people are, are also sleeping. Okay. Um, the main characteristic about these houses is that they're unregulated and unlicensed. Okay. So whereas maybe like a halfway house yes. has a license and is regulated by the state, these houses are private homes and they're owned and operated by private individuals. And so because that's the case, it's it's any of us could open a three-quarter house it's not it's not regulated by anyone nobody's overlooking it okay. um, so how are these how are the three-quarter houses funded then since there's no regulation yeah that's a good question so they're they're funded by people's rent so because people are okay. paying a very low amount of rent which is the shelter allowance that's given to people which is normally around two hundred and fifteen dollars per okay. month or um, they they have to jam a, a lot of people into the houses in order to, to make it a successful business model. Got it. Um, the second way that they're running this business is by causing illegal evictions and having this sort of revolving door of tenants. Oh. So they often have a list of rules and regulations that they themselves impose on yes. tenants. And if anybody breaks one of those rules, they can immediately just push them out and bring another tenant in. Okay. And then the third way is that 
as many people may have seen um, on the news recently, a lot of these three-quarter houses are uh, forcing tenants to go to substance abuse programs. Yes. And so there's a, an alleged fraud going on, Medicaid fraud, and um, people are receiving kickbacks. So there's mm -hmm. three main ways that, people, that these three-quarter houses are getting funded. So there's a lot of unscrupulous activities and illegal yeah. activities that are taking place with these three-quarter houses. Exactly. Right. So, you know, Andrew, you have personal experience living in a three-quarter house yes. and then now working to try to bring about some change. Yes. So can you tell us about your experience? Um, well, with the three-quarter housing, I generally had um, heard about it uh, coming through the shelter system. Okay. Um, like um, we explained earlier, I had been in prison for um, 18 and a half years and throughout the time that I've been um, released, I've been living like with family members or yes. after I lost my apartment due to not being able to secure jobs and sure. you know, things of that nature. And um, when it was explained to me about a three quarter house, I was under the assumption of uh, kind of like how halfway houses are, sure. like it would run in steps, like a halfway house, then three quarter house, okay. then transitional housing, then okay. permanent housing. So um, I was lured in by the, you know, the, the limelight discussions of three quarter houses helping you attain um, full housing and um, they help you with this and that and, um, you know, vocational training jobs and, you sure. know, things of that nature. Um, I was under the assumption it was a program. Um, when I went to the substance abuse program, um, they told me about the three-quarter housing that they had that runs with the program. Okay. So now I'm under the assumption that this is part of the program. So I enrolled in the three-quarter housing, um, which was a whole lot better than, you know, being inside of a shelter system or okay. house jumping from this apartment to that apartment. Yes. Um, it's the roof over my head. Yes. So uh, my first thing was like, how am I going to pay the rent? Yes. You know, the rent is $215 a month per person. Um, HRA usually pays the rent for each individual. Mm -hmm. They give you um, what's noted as a lease agreement uh, when you first come into the three-quarter housing. Mm -hmm. um, it may be named in different ways, but in the particular one that I came into, um, they call it a lease agreement. Um, you're to sign these lease agreements. Um, they waive certain rights that you're supposed to have. Um, it has the house rules in there to where if you violate any of these house rules, um, you can be terminated from the program immediately. Mm. Um, the authorities are threatened to be called on you if you don't mm. comply by the rules or what have you. Um, inside those rules, you're to attend a certain amount of groups per week in order to stay housed inside of the three-quarter house. Okay. So they tell you you have to go to their, you know, their group by name okay. and um, you have to attend three groups per week and every time your identification card is scanned, then Medicaid is being charged by these. So that's how they're so they generate income by generating uh, income yeah. by having us to scan our IDs. Yes. And um, as I said before, I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, all this is part of the program. True. So <clears throat> generally, I found out later on down the line that um, the three quarter housing actually isn't part of the program. The, the initial program mm -hmm. that um, I'm enrolled in, I do have to attend a certain amount of groups per week or yeah. whatever, but it has nothing to do with the housing. Okay. The housing isn't part of the program. The housing is separate and is privately owned. Um, in this manner, they kind of persuade the people to go to their group so that they can make more money off of it. Um, like I said, it's not really all bad in the sense that people need a place to stay. Sure. So being threatened of being kicked out onto the streets, um, you comply with these rules, yes. you know, and a lot of people don't question it. A okay. lot of people don't have, you know, the, the, the means to do anything else. Um, there's no kitchen facilities, as Paulette had mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, you're left, you have to fend for yourself, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing about the three-quarter housing is that I was under the assumption that I would be there for approximately anywhere from 
six to 18 months. And after that time limit was up, you know, I had to move on to the next phase. So I was thinking that I would be helped with whatever things I needed to be helped with as mm -hmm. far as, you know, obtaining housing or obtaining a, a, a vocational skill or anything mm -hmm. to help me when it comes to paying rent, because of sure. course I can't get into a private housing if I can't pay the rent. Mm -hmm. Um, and a, what HRA allots a person would barely scrape the bucket and pay a rent. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. But once I got in there, again, I noticed that none of this was happening. Mm -hmm. Like when you're in there, it's just like you're in a warehouse. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm in a room with three other guys. Uh, most of the rooms are four man rooms. You have some rooms that are two man rooms. Mm -hmm. um, lately, these past few weeks or so, they've been turning them into three man rooms. Yes. But even in prison, uh, I was allotted a certain amount of room per square feet mm -hmm. for each individual. Mm -hmm. If you're in a two-man cell, you're allotted a certain amount of space, so a cell has to be a certain size. Mm -hmm. These rooms are the size of a child's room, mm -hmm. and you have four adult men or four adult mm -hmm. women inside these rooms. There's no space. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's little room for belongings, private belongings. Like, you, you have to slide past each other, you know, mm -hmm. to get out the door. It's... it's a fire hazard in a lot of them places, okay. you know, being stuffed in like that. So thank you for sharing that experience. We really appreciate it. So Paulette, mm -hmm. I mean, we know that there, you know, are some issues that are going on with three-quarter housing, but you also have some three-quarter housing that's done properly, that's done according to the way the law allows for housing to take place. What is the scale of the problem with three-quarter housing? Um, well, we haven't found many places that are really providing the tr transitional housing that people deserve to have. Okay. Um, to give a little bit of background of who's living inside of three-quarter houses. Sure, that would be helpful. People are coming out of being formally incarcerated, formally yes. homeless. They have many health issues, yes. um, unemployment. So it's coming out of very different situ situations sure. and dealing people with a lot of problems. Often. You yeah. don't have many choices. Yeah. And so what's offered right now is this model of housing where it's not actually dealing with people's individual problems. And so yes. what we advocate for in the Three Quarter House Tenant Organizing Project is real affordable housing, but also different types of housing models that would allow support for all of these different types of issues that people are dealing with on a daily basis. Yes. Um, to date, we, we still are we're still looking for the the example that we want to find for a three-quarter house. And okay. So you mentioned that there were some issues like illegal evictions that mm -hmm. take place. Uh, some of the individuals are being told that they should take programming that they're not really required to take, mm -hmm. the Medicaid fraud. So is, are there things that are being done to correct and or address mm -hmm. some of these issues? I mean, are there some, is there someone who's like gonna be like a watchdog over three-quarter housing? We hope that we hope that it becomes more of an issue for the NYPD, for example, or other okay. law enforcement agencies like the, the DA or the AG. Yes. Um, currently, we're we're working with the NYPD to really start training officers in certain precincts where there's a high okay. amount of illegal evictions going on, to start allowing officers to know how to respond appropriately. So okay. when people are getting called out to these houses because an illegal eviction is happening. Yes. Oftentimes the NYPD will side with the house operator or the manager instead of really looking at the situation and seeing that a person is being illegally evicted if they've been living there for 30 days or longer. Yes, because so, the law in New York is that if they have been living there for 30 days or longer that they have exactly. certain rights, correct? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so people are often manipulated to think that because they signed these waivers or yes. Because they're living in a so-called program, they don't have they don't have to abide by this law. Got it. But because this is a place that's not it's not licensed, it's not regulated. It's just like any of our homes, yes, any yes, regular yes, apartment. Yes. So, what is the agreement, for example, that one is required to sign off on? Or, I mean, um, you had to sign something. Yeah. Andrew, what, like what? I said, on the, the the paper is is labeled as a lease agreement. Okay. Uh, so this is supposed to be my housing lease. Okay. Um, some of them are called um, waiver agreements. Um, they're, they're called a lot of different things, but in the particular one that I was in, it's called a lease agreement. Okay. And um, inside this lease agreement, um, it has the program rules for the housing there. But um, as Paulette mentioned, um, these houses 
aren't programs. Yes. They're being led to believe that there's programs. So when a situation occurs and um, they feel that you know a rule has been broken yeah. and you have to be discharged from the program, people are just leaving and being discharged and out in the streets when yeah. they don't have to because after you've been there for a certain amount of time, law protects your right to stay there. You have to go to court, housing court, and you know deal with it in a legal manner. Got it. Mm -hmm. And so there's a really like scandal going on right now that's in the papers, right? Because one large housing provider, Narco Freedom, mm -hmm. they had their CEO arrested recently mm -hmm. yeah. and charged with Medicaid fraud and mm -hmm. charged with some other very serious uh, you know, things that could potentially send them to prison. And so there are a lot of people who are housed, right, through Narco Freedom. I believe it's, I heard, 1,600 or so as yeah. the number. Yes. So. So is that, are there other large providers like that? Definitely. That's really putting a lot of people at risk for homelessness? Mm. There definitely are. And actually there's some connections that have been publicly made about Narco Freedom's executives with yes. other programs in the city um, and other operators. And so these places may be linked in some ways, but in general, the model is functioning the same yes. in, for the biggest operators. There are some three-quarter houses that we've heard of that aren't forcing people to go to substance abuse programs. Yes. But these major ones, like the one that you're mentioning, have. Yeah. So on average, <laughs> this seems to be taking place pretty widely, right? Yeah. yeah. So what are some recommendations that, mm -hmm. that you have and before we get to that, there's some coalition work that's taking place, mm -hmm. right? So what is the coalition doing to try to advocate for change around mm -hmm. uh, three-quarter housing? So the coalition that has been formed... Um, and are, who's made up of the... Who, what groups are made up of the coalition? There's many, many organizations that are on um, Legal Action Center, MFY Legal Services, the Three-Quarter House Tenant Organizing Project, you know, Legal Fortune Aid Society, Society Fortune involved. Society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, picture the homeless. There's, yes, there's yes. a bunch of different organizations in New York that okay. are involved. But there's a policy agenda that's been developed around different points. Okay. The heart of the problem, obviously, is affordable housing, a lack of, of lack real of affordable sure, housing. Sure. And as I mentioned before, the fact that there need to be alternative models of housing for different needs that Got people it. have. Um, one of the other pieces that the coalition has been working on recently is this issue with narco freedom. Because, because this is being turned over to a receiver right now, yes. we, we would really want this to be done in the safest way possible for tenants and to keep okay. tenants in mind. And so some recommendations that we've had around that are just to, first of all, put tenants' voices involved in the conversation because... Okay. Are they involved now? Do, are tenants, like, are you being asked mm, to, no. to be involved um, in conversations that are taking place often at some high levels around no. change? Actually, I'm, I'm myself, I'm in a narco freedom house. So mm -hmm. this is affecting me personally and um, all of the other men and women that are in narco freedom houses. Um, we, as of to date, like we have no clue of what's going on and uh, we're the ones that's going to be affected if the program um, is given to a receiver and the receiver has any changes um, in the structure of how the three-quarter house is being ran and uh, we don't fit the criteria we can be homeless in, in a matter of days weeks or months like so we don't no know. one is coming to you and saying no one has come to us and this said is what anything we are discussing with the city or discussing with other agencies that might take over no Nothing. The only the only clue that that I personally have is you know dealing with um, Paulette and, and the top organization and um, the coalition. Um, I have a little more insight than other yeah. individuals would have, and yeah. once I uh, have knowledge on the situation and what's going on, I go back and I share what I can with you know people that are listen. As I mean, you know, we have to admit that not everyone listens or not everyone has. Uh, the interest in what's going on, but yeah. um, I myself do, and yeah. a lot of other people do, but they haven't come to us and said anything. Got it. Now, you talked about the bigger issue of people just not having access to housing. I mean, we mm -hmm. know that is a huge issue for people coming out of uh, criminal justice system, jails and prisons. We know sometimes that even the HUD definition kind of acts 
poses as as an impediment, right? Because mm -hmm. you need to to have been jailed for only 90 days or so, right? Mm -hmm. 90 days or less, and then you needed to have been homeless before you even went inside. So that acts, again, as a challenge for people. So who are the players, who are the people, who are the actors that can make the changes that are necessary around three-quarter housing? I think it's at a city level and it's at a state level. There's different agencies that are involved and could certainly make three-quarter houses better to Got begin it. with. Because um, one is Medicaid funds, right? If someone is swiping someone's Medicaid card, then they're receiving some funding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the Department of Health, I believe, kind of like oversees, right? The Medicaid for these different uh, right. three-quarter houses? Well, the, the mm -hmm. public assistance. Public assistance. Yeah, the Medicaid okay. is actually for the program itself, the substance abuse yeah. program that people attend. And um, Oasis um, does the regulating. Does the regulating for the, the substance, substance abuse. Substance abuse mm -hmm. yeah. So who, so the, there are these different players, the city, state, who is it like among, are there specific agencies? That could help. That could help, that Certainly. should be conducting the oversight? I, w I wouldn't say, to, I mean, there's certainly agencies that need to be more involved in regulating. OASIS is a, is a big one, HRA is another one. Yes. Um, but there's other agencies that could, be, could do their homework in a better way to really start referring people to better, better three-quarter houses. So right now, the model exists and there's some really, really terrible actors out there. Yes. Um, and to make some immediate changes, docs, for example, or DHS, they could be referring directly to the, the, the better ones. Yes. And other organizations, I think, in New York City could also